My name is Ian, you're watching Big Rock Moto, and thank you so much for tuning in on this beautiful spring day. Heavyweight touring cruisers like this BMW R18 Transcontinental make up a huge market segment, especially here in the USA. So here's a statistic that might almost sound too crazy to believe, but believe me, it is true. Harley Davidson controls 84% of the worldwide market for heavyweight cruiser bikes. So with that statistic in mind, it makes total sense that brands like BMW and others would really like to get a piece of this lucrative pie, especially with the fact that these motorcycles in this segment often have transaction prices of over $30,000 US. BMW's R18 line, including this transcontinental you see here, are powered by BMW's imposing 1800cc boxer engine, which by itself weighs over 244 pounds, which just for reference is actually more than the entire weight of the KTM 350EXC dual sport motorcycle. This particular model here, the Transcontinental, when it's fully loaded, is the largest, heaviest at over 942 pounds fully fueled up and most expensive, base price is $25,000, but this model with all the accessories you see is over $35,000 US. The BMW R18 models, they have like a base model, a classic model, a bagger model, and then the Transcontinental. So what you get with the Transcontinental is a fully integrated luggage, more wind protection, a larger fairing, more technology and features, a higher seat height, and a lot of other changes that we're gonna talk through in this video. Now, this is definitely not the first time that BMW Motorhead has tried to get into this cruiser market. If we want to go back in time to 1997, about 25 years ago, BMW introduced a model called the R1200C. However, the problem is, and the problem was back then as well, that cruiser riders, despite trying and attempting to project this sort of rebel image, they're actually extremely conformist and they all want to be like each other. So they don't tend to stray outside of their preferred bikes, their preferred brands, their preferred way of dressing and, and the way that they like to ride. With all that going against BMW and the fact that the R1200C had some really weird styling and really didn't make a lot of power either, it really wasn't a very big sales success for them and they ended up discontinuing that bike in 2003. Now, of course, everybody's question is for BMW, is BMW going to be successful trying to get back into the cruiser market now that they're trying it in 2021, 2022 when I'm filming this? And the truth is, I can't answer that question. None of us can really answer that question yet. There are early indications that the bikes are not selling that well, but it's a big worldwide market and it needs time to catch on. So we can't really answer that and history and sales numbers will have to be the true marker of whether this was a success. But what we can do and what we are gonna do today is really show you all this bike's features and technology. So here's how I'm gonna break down the video today. I'm gonna to take you on a tour and show you all the features, technology, talk about the specifications of this bike, all the equipment that it has. Then we're gonna get it out on the highway, we're gonna take it on the freeway, I'm gonna show you the adaptive cruise control, how the radio works, how all the technology works. Then we're gonna come back here, we're gonna talk about what I like about the bike, what I don't like about the bike, we'll talk about it a little bit versus competition, and then we'll have some final thoughts. So with that being said, let's go for a ride. All right, let's take you on a tour around this giant beast, BMW R18 Transcontinental. Show you some of the specs, features, cool technology and equipment that this motorcycle has. This thing is absolutely fully loaded, has a lot of extra equipment on it. So why don't we start by talking about the engine just a little bit. It's BMW's 1802cc 
air-cooled boxer twin engine and it puts out at the crank around 91 horsepower which is not a lot for such a large engine but this engine is designed for torque and it's an old school engine it's air-cooled push rod design kind of a throwback style there and it has a lot of character the torque is pretty good coming in at 116 foot pounds of torque the engine has a very low compression ratio of only 9.6 to 1 and you can see the push rod design here the design of the engine is absolutely gorgeous on this bike it really reminds you of the old school bmw boxers this giant uh, engine here and then you can see everything's just beautifully detailed and there's no external like cables or wiring or piping it's very beautiful beautiful how they've put this together. You can see the bike does have an oil cooler down here. While we're talking about the drivetrain, let's talk about the transmission. It's a six-speed transmission with a slipper assist clutch. One interesting thing is that it's an exposed drive shaft. You can see down here they've exposed the drive shaft. So if you were able to see this when the bike was moving, it, it spins. It's really, really cool and interesting how they did that. And of course, it's nice to have shaft drive on a touring motorcycle. No belts or chains to worry about maintaining. <laughs> Let's start up at the front of the motorcycle and uh, we'll walk through some of the equipment and talk about some of the specs as we go. So you can see this large front fender, a 300 millimeter twin disc with four piston BMW branded brake calipers there. The fork is a very large fork, but it has just under five inches to travel. So that's about the kind of travel you would expect from a bike like this. You can see they have these auxiliary LED uh, driving or fog lights here, as well as the main beam, which is an LED headlight. This is not an adaptive headlight like some of the other BMW models have. Now these are interesting here. These are adjustable wind deflectors. So if you put them in this position, it directs air at the rider for cooling. If you put them here, it directs air away from the rider if you're riding in colder temperatures or just want to have less wind. I mentioned the oil cooler here. You can see the front of the engine. These extra wind protection kind of fairings come only on the transcontinental. The giant, giant exhaust outlets here and this chrome engine bar kind of tip over bar where I have my Insta360 camera mounted, which is a very handy place to mount that. Another interesting feature that we're going to show you out on the road is this BMW Adaptive Cruise Control. It's one of the only motorcycles in the world to ever feature adaptive cruise. So if you've used it in a car, what it does is it has a radar sensor in front and it can adjust its speed up or down depending on the traffic in front of you. Amazing feature, both of my wife and I's vehicles have it and it's something I've really come to love. You can see the large fairing here, pretty large windshield, which is completely non-adjustable there. I forgot to mention the wheel sizes, so you've got a 19-inch front wheel and you've got a 16-inch rear wheel, which is kind of common for cruiser motorcycles. Uh, the rear tire is a 180 section and the front tire is a 180 section, I mean, sorry, 120 section, and that's a pretty common size for a cruiser bike like this. The fuel tank on the Transcontinental is larger than the other R18 models at 6.3 gallons, which gives you a riding range of around 200 to 250 miles. The seat height on this bike is the tallest in the R18 range, which gives you more leg room and it's around 29 inches. The overall curb weight, fully fueled up, ready to go with everything you see on it, on this bike is just over 940 pounds. So this is a giant beast of a motorcycle at almost one half ton. With a rider on it, it's definitely over a half a ton. So you've heard of half ton pickups, now you've heard of half ton motorcycles. The rear suspension, which you can't really see under here, it's just under five inches to travel as well. And it's electronically controlled so that when you put more weight on the bike, the computer automatically adjusts the preload for you so that's a nice feature there you can see the luggage on this bike the way that you operate it is it has a lock here which you can also operate from the key which I'll show you these big chrome levers open up and the luggage is very well constructed it feels like a vault extremely extremely solid you have a total of about a hundred liters of storage let me show you in the top case here simply pop this open you can also see the speakers in here which take up a tiny bit of room but it's worth it for the good sound that they provide um, this will not fit two like normal size helmets, but you can put one helmet in it. You can see this bike has the optional Vance and Heinz exhaust, which is a very expensive option, but it does add a little bit of sound to the bike. And if you're buying a bike that's this expensive already, what the heck, you might as well throw that in too. Coming on the back, you can see kind of the swoopy rear fender. I also want to mention the frame on this bike is different from the frame on the other 18 models. It's beefed up to support the extra weight of the Transcontinental. 
I wanted to mention the audio system. So you've got speakers in the saddlebags, you've got speakers in the rear trunk, so that's one, two, three, four, and of course you've got front speakers up in the fairing. It puts out something like 200 watts, and this sound system is rocking. It is seriously impressive. Now, for me personally, I don't really feel that comfortable like going through towns and stuff with the music bl blaring out of my motorcycle. I just feel embarrassed by that, although it's kind of a thing here in America. People do that with their Harleys and that's just to each his own, but I don't really like doing that. But I do find out on the highway, cruising around, I can play the sound, and it actually comes through really, really well. And it's kind of nice not to have to wear uh, speakers in your helmet if you don't want to do that. You can see the bike comes with floorboards. You've got the passenger floorboards here, which I should probably retract. You've got the big, comfortable seat, very comfortable, very nicely designed seat, as you would expect from BMW. A backrest and kind of these, kind of these side armrests as well. The driver floorboards here, and then you've got a heel toe shifter, which I'm not a fan of it, uh, but that's what you get on a lot of motorcycles like this. All right, let me jump on board here and give you a tour of kind of the cockpit. So why don't we start down here in this area? So if you push this button, it opens the fuel filler door, which exposes the fuel filler cap, which is a separate item. If you take this off, uh, it doesn't have like it's not attached to the bike, so you have to set it somewhere and uh, you know deal with that but that's not a big deal it's kind of nice so they concealed it behind this chrome cover when you start to work with this bike and, and, and feel around all the controls, everything is what you would expect from BMW. It's super high quality finished, no cheaping out on anything. If you press this button, what you have here is a compartment for your cell phone, which, a lot, which has a little fan in it to keep your phone cool. And I have the Android plug on here, which is USB-C, but they also include an iPhone plug as well. You can put your phone in here and uh, connect it to the bike and, and allow it to charge. However, it's not wireless charging. However, what I found is that my phone, uh, which is the Galaxy S20, with a very pretty slim case on it, will not fit in this compartment, so I am unable to use it. And I'm not willing to take the case off my phone because it's a $1,200 phone and I don't want to break it if I drop it, which I do drop it all the time because I'm working. So I think it's kind of a bad design that I didn't make this larger. However, if I did take this out of the case, I would be able to stick it in here and plug it in. You do need to connect the, your phone to Bluetooth to access the navigation, a lot of the controls through here. And of course, that's going to drain your battery when you're using like the nav and stuff like that. So it'd be nice to be able to plug it in here, but I'm not able to do that. Let's talk through some of the controls on the dashboard here. Let me turn on the power to the bike. So the bike doesn't have a typical key. What it has, and I forgot to talk about the key, which is in my pocket up here. Well, that's an interesting error message. I haven't seen that before. I don't know what's on with that. It says right auxiliary headlight faulty. That's the first time that's come up. We'll get rid of that message. So this is the key to the bike. And what you have here, you can lock and unlock the luggage centrally uh, through here. So you can lock all your saddlebags to the key and also activate can also activate the bike's alarm if it's so equipped through this key. So you just keep this in your in your pocket tucked away when you're riding a bike with the keyless ride. And then on this bike you have a power button uh, up here on the handlebar. And a lot of BMWs have power buttons down here, but of course of this style you don't have that. So let's talk through some of the uh, controls here on the bike. You have adjustable levers, clutch and brake levers. On the left-hand switch gear, you've got the BMW Wonder Wheel, which works really, really well, and I've always liked that. Uh, you've got the menu up and down button, which can go through your different menus. Trying to get rid of this error message. So you can see here, if I go in, I can do navigation, radio. You can go into vehicle, which then you can get uh, your messages, your trip computers, all the information here, fuel mileage, tire pressures, all the stuff you expect from BMW. And I'll show you the navigation here in a minute. Um, so we go back to here, and then you can put different things on the screen. And you also have here a spot for the music controls, and I can show you the radio here in a second. Uh, this button here is to set the distance on the adaptive cruise. So when you've got that uh, adaptive cruise set up, uh, 
you know, to turn the cruise control on, you can set the distance uh, how close you want it to follow the vehicle that uh, you're following behind. So I set it to the medium setting, hazard light button, the main cruise control button, riding mode button. So you've got rock, you've got rain, roll. Roll is like the standard mode. Rock is the more aggressive mode. It just controls the throttle response, essentially, things like that. Then you have the uh, switch for the, uh, I think this is the extra auxiliary light switch there. High beam switch is behind. On the right hand switch gear, you've got your normal stop start or button, power button. And this is, oh, and there's another locking button here. So if you don't want to use a key, you can lock the bike up with all the luggage using this button here. You can see you've got a lot of chrome. This bike has the Roland design, Roland Sands design, extra pieces on here, chrome mirrors, power outlet right here. And then the gauges, you've got a very, very nice fuel gauge, which gives you a lot of a uh, lot of nice reading there, fine amount of reading. And then you've got a speedometer, goes up to 130 miles an hour, tachometer, red line 5,500 RPM. And then this interesting power reserve gauge, which essentially I believe is tied to the throttle position. I'll show you that in a minute. But when you uh, when you open the throttle, that gauge goes down, showing you have less power in reserve. I think they honestly stuck this in here because they didn't know what to do with this gauge pod. Probably would have been better used for like oil temperature or engine temperature or something. But it's kind of a gimmick. But I don't know. It's kind of cool. I actually kind of like it because it's, it's unique. Okay, so I've got my phone connected here through Bluetooth, and I've got the navigation here in the map mode. So you can have a map up on here. It's not Google Maps, it's BMW's own system. Um, and that's a frustration I think we have with a lot of modern motorcycles and vehicles. Why don't they just give us Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, make it easy, make it simple, make it more universal. But they don't do that. They try to make their own system, and it's kind of fidgety. It does work, but you can play around with it. I don't really like using it, but you can do routing and things through here. Um, some people would elect to just mount their phone somewhere here and just, you know, use it through their phone. But you do have integration here uh, with that. One thing to note, though, if you are using that map mode, it ties up your phone and you cannot lock your phone. So it's going to drain your battery pretty fast. And unless you can connect it in here, you're, you're not going to be able to keep it charged up. So we'll go ahead and get, get out of that. Let me show you media here. You can access media on your phone and you can play things that are stored on your phone. Uh, you've got the telephone here. You, if you have a headset connected, you can obviously do phone calls. So let's go back here to the radio and switch this to switch this on. Let's turn this to Sirius here. Put on some Lady Gaga. I know all of you are going to like that. And then when the radio is on, you can control uh, the song and the station through the Wonder Wheel, also the volume here through the Wonder Wheel as well. <coughs> and you can see it has this image of the Boxer engine here, which is kind of cool. Then you've got a speed limit display. The speed limit will come up here as long as your phone is connected. <coughs> Cruise control settings, miles per hour, riding mode, range, which you can cycle through here, fuel gauge, odometers, trip meters, tire pressure, riding range, and then over here you've got phone information and your music. So there's just a lot going on here. This is a heavyweight, ultra luxury, ultra equipped touring motorcycle, so it just takes a long time to talk through all this stuff. Okay, let's saddle up, go out for a ride on this bike, and show you what this beast is all about to ride. So one of the first things you notice when getting on, the seat's pretty nice and low on a bike like this. You can easily flat foot it for most people. I'm five foot ten, just for reference. The side stand is kind of strange. It sticks out really far, and it doesn't feel that sturdy, but... I mean, again, you're looking at almost a half ton motorcycle, so you just have to live with it. The motorcycle is extremely heavy, so pushing it around at slow speeds like this is almost impossible and you need to either use the motor or use the reverse feature which I'll show you to move this thing around it's just very very awkward and especially when you've got when you're turning and maneuvering like this it's so heavy and because of the way the handlebars are on this style of bike this feels very very awkward like you could easily drop it so definitely test one of these out if you're thinking of buying one just to make sure you can handle just the weight and the size and the bulk of something like this Now what you notice when you start it up is the whole bike goes like this because it's a huge boxer engine and that's the force that acts on the bike because of the way the crankshaft works on this motorcycle. If you rev up the bike like that, uh, you can hear, or you can feel, I should say, the motorcycle going side to side. Now this windshield being non-adjustable, it's going to kind of be in the way for our filming here, but that's just the way it is. It's at a pretty good height for me. 
uh, although it would be nice to have an adjustment for sure. Now you see here it says power reserve gauge I talked about. So when I open the throttle, you can see the power reserve going down like that. The riding position is not foot forward, so the, your feet are kind of underneath you behind these big cylinders here, um, which is different and some people don't like that if they're used to something like a Harley with the controls out in front. Personally, I like the riding position here. I like having my feet uh, kind of underneath my knees like that. I feel like you control the motorcycle a lot better that way. Maneuvering this thing around on steep roads and tight driveways or any parking situation. It's just very very big You have to be super uh, careful with what you're doing All right riding the R18 finally other reviewers have noted that the engine has a lot of vibration and it it just does at certain rpms you feel vibration coming through the bike you can see the windshield shake you can see the mirror shake but it depends what rpm you're at and you can find a good cruising rpm that's part of the character of this huge boxer twin now in terms of handling as you would kind of expect from bmw they did a pretty good job with the handling of this bike even though this thing weighs, you know, almost half a ton, you actually get pretty good handling here through the corners. This is obviously a bike to go out for a comfortable cruise. It's not a sporty bike, it's not a fast bike, uh, but it handles well for its size and it's pretty enjoyable to ride. It has a unique sound, you feel the engine working underneath you. Everything about it does feel a little bit special. So it's kind of interesting for me riding this style of bike. This is not a style of bike that, that is really up my alley. It's never something I've really wanted to own. But after I've been spending more time with this, I could see myself someday owning this style of bike, this heavyweight kind of transcontinental kind of touring cruiser motorcycle. Because what I notice is I don't hustle it really fast. I'm not looking at the performance. I'm just kind of enjoying the scenery, kicking back with kind of nice, comfortable riding position. Uh, you know, I've got all this wind protection. I've got my stereo here. I've got this engine with a lot of torque that just kind of pushes me along gently. And I just feel like I could cruise around all day. And I, I like it. I mean, I really do actually like it. Now, so this infotainment has a lot of different ways you can configure it and use it while you're riding. Now that I've gone into the navigation mode from the menu, it's given me this widescreen map, which is kind of nice. This big whole thing now is filled up with my navigation screen. Now, if I go back out of that, I can just have a, uh, a small navigation screen here on the right. Now, your phone needs to be connected um, to use that, by the way. Okay, let's do some acceleration runs here. Test the brakes. Brakes are definitely adequate. You always expect that with BMW. Pretty strong, not too much brake dive. almost forgot to show you guys how the reverse works so you see when the motorcycle is facing downhill like it is here at almost a thousand pounds you can't really move it backwards so for parking reverse is very helpful so what you do is you have to reach down here and flip this lever which is kind of a pain and then R comes up on the dash so when R comes up on the dash then you hit the starter button and the bike walks in reverse at about one mile an hour or so you hear this kind of sewing machine type noise and I can reverse as much as I want it's really really handy and a necessary feature on a bike this heavy and when you're done using it you reach down here pull the lever up and it goes back to neutral still getting used to that heel toe shifter it works fine once you just get used to it Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean 70, I mean I'm doing almost 80 miles per hour and it feels like I'm barely moving. It's, uh, it's pretty smooth. You can feel a little tiny bit of buzz coming through the bars around 80 miles an hour, but nothing that would really bother me. You can see the mirrors buzz a tiny bit at that RPM. Just depends on what RPM you're at. 2500 is a bit smoother and that's around 75. Up around 80. Yeah, a tiny bit of buzz, but I don't think it would bug me. I mean, you set cruise control and you kind of kick back. This is what this bike is really designed to do. Cover a lot of distances at higher speeds. Cruise the countryside. I mean, I could totally see just chasing the horizon on this thing all day. Just hitting Route 66 and stop a little country diner, stay at little motels. You know, see the USA. This is the kind of bike that you want to do that on. That's really what they had in mind. And I mean, man, if I had the time, I would do that right now. It's very comfortable. So let me show you the adaptive cruise control here. Uh, so go ahead and activate the system. We'll set to 75. Now I've got a slow car in front of me. Now you see I've taken my hand off the throttle entirely. And the motorcycle is adjusting to the speed of the vehicle in front of me. So that vehicle is traveling about 55 miles an hour. We're behind some semis. And the motorcycle is maintaining this much distance. Now I can change the distance. If I go uh, the medium distance, it's going to accelerate and bring me a little bit closer. Now this is not too weird to me because I'm used to adaptive cruise control in my car. In both of our cars actually. So it's something that I'm used to. Uh, but it could be a weird sensation if it's new to you. Now this car is hitting the brakes. Now you'll see that the motorcycle will decelerate on its own. It's a very effective system. It works well and it's not really that new a technology. I mean cars have had this for for quite some time. The nice thing about this is that if you drive in a lot of traffic and you like to use cruise control, which I do, it, it takes a lot of the uh, fatigue out of out of riding because you don't have to you know be constantly adjusting your speed to try to keep the right following distance and it's kind of nice now i'm not sure like if it would do emergency braking for you how hard it would brake like if the car up there suddenly slammed on its brakes i'm not sure i'd want to test that out but i have a feeling it would do actually a pretty good job in that situation but it doesn't replace actual driver input in in emergency rear world situations so now if i change lanes what's going to happen is motorcycle is now going to accelerate now there's no vehicle in front of me back up to my preset speed of 74 so I can increase this here let's go 77 so I've got the cruise control set what happens if I pull in behind this semi here what you see is then it shows a car on the screen like okay there's a car in front of you and the bike decelerates very smoothly and backs off the distance that you have set here So one of the things that I love about the BMW R18 Transcontinental, well, there's a few things that come to mind right away. Now, full disclosure, as I go through this review, and a lot of you know this, but I'm really not a cruiser type of rider. I don't really enjoy the way that they handle. I find that their styling really compromises some of their performance, and it's just not really my thing. But I'm trying to be as objective and fair as possible and really not let that cloud my judgment when I'm evaluating this bike. That's just one example of why I really don't love cruiser bikes. After I turned the camera off and was coming back here to the house to finish up this filming that I'm doing now, I was starting to get a little more familiar with the bike and I was starting to push it a little bit more in the corners, which is something I do on all my motorcycles. I like to go through corners, you know, at a decent pace when I'm riding a motorcycle. And I was in the left-hand corner and I kept leaning a little bit more and the left-hand uh, floorboard touched down really, really hard. And it was a very, a threatening, very sort of like, uh, very bad reaction for me. I felt very scared because I couldn't lean the motorcycle anymore and the corner was tightening up a little bit. And so that's just an example of why I'm not a huge fan of this kind of bike. But again, I'm trying not to let that cloud my judgment, but I just wish that 
you could get a bike like this that had a little bit better cornering clearance because I really hate that feeling of having my lean angle limited by the floorboard or the foot pegs or whatever that might be. All right, so what are the things I love about the bike? So the fit and finish and the attention to detail and the overall build quality are amazing on this motorcycle and really second to none. Everything you look at, everything you touch, everything you feel, everything you interact with, it's what you expect from BMW. And I think that does make it feel a bit higher quality than some of its competition from Harley Davidson and from Indian. Another thing I love about this bike is it's very unique. This gigantic boxer engine, not just the way it looks, but the way it sounds and the way it feels. This motorcycle's presence on the road, its overall appearance, uh, it makes it unique and it stands out and it's not like everything else out there. So if you're looking for a touring cruiser, but you don't want a Harley or an Indian, then this is something you should definitely be looking at. Another thing I love about the bike is all the technology it has. In particular, the adaptive cruise control is very, very good. It works very seamlessly and it's a genuinely useful feature. Although I am a little bit puzzled why it's appearing on this bike first and not something like the, their GS Adventure, which they sell far more of and which a lot of people are using for long distance touring. I know they have it on the RT and I'm not sure, but I think they have it on the updated 1600 GTs. But nonetheless, it's a feature I'd like to see a more wide adoption on all of their touring motorcycles. All right, so one of the things I don't like about this motorcycle, now I know I already went on a tangent or a soapbox about the cornering clearance. That's not so much a criticism of this particular bike, it's more a criticism of this category in general and just why I really don't see myself ever owning one, even though I kind of like the styling and I kind of like how they feel out on the open road. Another thing I don't like about this bike, and again, this is not really just this model, but it's just this category, is that these motorcycles are just extremely heavy, which makes them very awkward to maneuver at low speeds. So getting it in and out of your garage, in and out of parking spots in the city, urban environments, if you get uh, like off center or you have steep hills, it just is very intimidating at almost a thousand pounds. It just, um, it's a big motorcycle and you feel every pound of that weight. Another thing I don't like is that I really wish they had some sort of power adjustable windshield. There's some other bikes that have that in the touring category, and I just don't like not being able to adjust the windshield up and down to control the wind flow. Another thing I don't like is about the bike is that it really kind of locks you into one riding position. And while I find the riding position to be pretty good, I would like to be able to stretch my legs out. I mean, after all, this is a touring cruiser. I thought that was the point of a bike like this, but because of this big boxer engine here, it makes that a little bit difficult. Now, I do find that I can kind of rest my, the bottom of my boot heel, like up on this floorboard, or not floorboard, this, uh, highway bar here, or this engine tip over bar, but your pant leg is kind of touching the cylinder and you worry about, you know, like catching your pant on fire or getting too hot. And, you know, being on fire when you're riding is not a good idea, but I did find I could do that, but I just wish there was a, a better way to sort of stretch your legs out in more riding positions. The other thing I don't like about the motorcycle is it's pretty slow. I mean, I have to be honest, like it could use 20 or 30 more horsepower. I mean, you're looking at 1800 cc engine, and although it has quite a bit of torque at 116 foot pounds, just when you really wanna go and get after it and accelerate, it's just a bit lazy. And uh, part of that has to do with the fact that it weighs almost a thousand pounds, but I could use some more power. And if you look at the competitors from Indian with the engine that they have, I forget the code name of that engine, but that's quite a bit more horsepower than this. So normally I have a separate segment for talking about the competitors and then I do final thoughts, but I'm gonna kind of lump this all into one for the sake of time and simplicity. So here are my final thoughts on this motorcycle. The R18 Transcontinental is a beautiful, uniquely styled, comfortable, technology-laden motorcycle, but it's also extremely heavy, extremely expensive, and has a very tough uh, sort of path to blaze here in light of its very good competitors. Now the direct competition for this model would be something like the Harley Davidson Road Glide, the Indian Roadmaster or the Indian Pursuit, uh, Yamaha's Star Venture, and bikes like that. But we all know that Harley really controls this market. Now all the bikes in this category, they all weigh over 900 pounds and they all cost somewhere around or in excess of $30,000 when you add options to them. So they're all kind of in the same, same weight range and the same price. So it's not fair to criticize this bike in terms of being heavy or expensive because all of its competitors are the same. 
In terms of value, the BMW, if, especially if you look at some of the base models of the Transcontinental, starting around 25,000, or even if you add the premium pack to that, bring it up to around 28 or 29,000, it's actually a pretty good value for what you're getting compared to the Harley and Indian competition, uh, if you look at the levels of equipment, but also the levels of fit and finish and quality. However, I know, and we already know, just as a fact, that many buyers of this kind of motorcycle are already very, very loyal to the brand that they're in, most likely being Harley-Davidson. And I don't think that this bike really has anything in particular that's gonna draw that type of buyer away from their loyalty to those American brands to something like this. I just don't see that happening except in rare occasions. Now you're probably looking at this motorcycle because you want a touring cruiser. If you simply want a good, comfortable, long distance motorcycle with a lot of power, a lot of technology, then there are frankly a lot better options that bikes that weigh much less, they cost less, they handle way better, they, they're way faster and they have better technology all around. So BMW has the R1250RT, they have the RS, they have their GT series with the inline six engine, Honda has bikes like the Goldwing, and there's a bunch of other bikes I could name. But it doesn't really matter that those bikes are better because if you're looking at this bike, you want something in this category. So I definitely think BMW is kind of swimming upstream here against the current and trying to break into this market. Only time is gonna tell if they're gonna be successful. But as I've said already, I, I just, I don't know that there are going to be many of these loyalist uh, riders who are going to switch away from their American brands that they've come to love and go to something like this. Now, I could be wrong about that, and please let me know in the comments what you think about it. Also, around the world, there's a sort of more interest in the cruiser segment. And people in other countries and European countries and other places around the world, they may not have the loyalties or even the desire to own a Harley or an Indian, and they might really strongly consider a BMW cruiser bike. So that's something that we may not have factored in. My closing thoughts on the BMW R18 Transcontinental is that when you ride this bike, even when you come up and look at it and sit on it and approach it, you know that it's something unique, something special, and something different with a very, very high level of quality and fit and finish and some interesting and unique design features. Although personally, this is not my style of motorcycle and I cannot see myself really buying this bike or really any of its competitors, if I'm being honest, I do sincerely appreciate what BMW have done here in creating this bike. I think it's a special motorcycle. I think it's one that deserves your attention if you're shopping in this category. So do yourself a favor. And if you're looking at anything like this, please don't discount BMW. Go take a look at it. They have really good test ride programs, usually pretty good dealerships. So it should definitely be in the running for you and I encourage you to take a look at it. So I think I'm gonna leave it at that. Please support Big Rock Moto. There's ways to do that in the description below. Other than that, ride safe and I'll see you out there. A breath.